Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the first of our two sessions on AI at the Edge, a practical introduction to Maxim Integrated Max 78000 AI Accelerator. Uh, this is brought to you by a partnership between Maxim Integrated and EBV Electronic. My name is Chris Artis, and I lead the business uh, development for microcontrollers at, at Maxim Integrated. Uh, and my co-presenters are Robert Muxel, who uh, leads our system architecture for the AI products, and Sean Brooks, an application support engineer uh, for the AI products. Most of the presentation will come from Robert and Sean, uh, so you have to listen to very little of the marketing guy. It, uh, once I get done with the first couple minutes here, it'll all get very technical very quickly. This is the first session of two that will focus on practical aspects of working with our new AI accelerator microcontroller, the Max 78000. Across these two sessions, our goal is to take you through the entire development process, both the machine learning portion and the embedded development side. In the first session, we'll start with some overviews. After I talk really briefly about the device and its benefits, Robert will go into a much deeper overview of the Max 78000 device. We'll also take you through the documentation and the tools that are available for, for the device. Uh, once that orientation portion is done, uh, we'll talk in much more detail about the tools for the machine learning side and how the train networks that can run on the Max 78000. In the second session, we'll pick up where we left off uh, with the trained network, and we'll talk about how you take that trained network and bring it into the embedded world uh, in, in a form that's suitable to run on our part. And we'll show this to you in the context of the board you see here on this slide, the Max 78000 Feather Board. It's a nice, small, low-cost evaluation kit uh, that still has a lot of features, uh, but small enough that you can prototype uh, you know, small, embedded, wearable types of applications. So before we really let the technical team get going, I just want to give a brief introduction to the Max 78000. And first, let me just start off by talking a little bit about uh, the, the, uh, the market that we're trying to approach with the Max 78000. Um, what we see at Maxim is that there's a real gap uh, between big machines' ability to adopt AI technology and little machines' ability to adopt AI technology. While we're all used to the, the, the big equipment on the left uh, adopting AI technology in terms of being able to see and hear much like humans uh, to the point where they can you know, drive cars autonomously or understand natural language to, to a, a very great extent, we see much more limited capabilities in, in, the, in the devices on the right, where at most they tend to be able to support maybe a simple wake word. And the real reason for that is because they are uh, they're constrained by the devices that implement them. The microcontrollers that are usually in these devices can't really handle, in a realistic sense, uh, AI applications much more than just simple wake words, something like a Hey Alexa. And so what we're trying to do with our Max 78000 and its uh, follow-on devices is close that gap and let the machines on the right start to see and hear, um, you know, actually have vision-based applications, but also hear uh, much more complex uh, things, maybe more sounds or uh, have a bigger vocabulary. And the reason that we see that gap today is because the, the one of the main workhorses of machine learning, the convolutional neural network, is computationally expensive. It takes billions of multiplies to, to execute an insight, um, which leads to uh, high power consumption. It leads to devices that have to be very fast, so they run very hot, um, and in some cases are, are extremely expensive. This is probably okay for things like the self-driving car that can adopt the cost of, a, of an expensive GPU or FPGA, but it doesn't really help the embedded equipment, the little machines that you saw on the right-hand side of that slide. To address this, Maxim designed the Max 78000. What you see here on the block diagram that Rob will get into much more detail on is really two sides of the chip. On the left-hand side, you see things that you might expect from any normal microcontroller. You see actually two microcontroller cores, uh, a Cortex-M4F and a RISC-V. You see a lot of external memory interfaces, and you see integrated memory. But on the right-hand side, that's the real magic of the part. It's our own homegrown uh, CNN accelerator. It's really a big state machine that will run through an entire scene in computation once it's configured and once the data is loaded um, and the weights are loaded. But it'll run through a computation, run through an inference on, on its own. 
Uh, there's a lot of uh, special sauce in that accelerator. We've really designed it to try to lower the energy consumption to lessen the data movement uh, that happens in those CNN computations. The microcontroller sections you see on the left, really their main job is not to take part in that AI inference or in that CNN computation, but really to get data from the outside world to the CNN accelerator in as low a power way as possible, and then do something with the result. Um, you know, Take the result, put it on a display, uh, send it to a radio, what, whatever the appropriate action is to take. So some of the results that we're seeing with the Max 78000 is at the high level, we're, we see that it's making the energy required to make an AI inference almost irrelevant. And so what you see here is you see uh, kind of the three parts of making an AI inference from a system perspective and the relative energy consumption um, of those. In the traditional micro, um, you see that the energy required for the AI inference for kept doing all those millions or billions of calculations in the CNN uh, is is dominant and, and takes up so much more energy than things like any data manipulation that has to happen before you run the CNN or the any of the input or output getting the data from the outside sending the data back to something outside. What the Max N8000 has done is really lowered the inference energy required to uh, to uh, execute a vision inference or hearing inference. Um, and, and we've also taken some steps to minimize the amount of data that's required for data manipulation by integrating a low power risk five core and some other features. And so what we see is that, you know, in many applications, the energy of the inference no longer matters and we put it back in the camp of the energy required to uh, to input the data, the data, for example, to access a camera or to access, access a microphone, is now again the dominant term. So let's look at a little bit more real data and maybe some comparisons uh, on the Max 78000. Uh, we've got a couple demos that are part of our evaluation kit uh, and are on the GitHub repository uh, that we'll talk about later. Um, the, that are pretty powerful demos. One is a keyword spotter that, that can spot 20 words. And then one is a face ID. Um, and so there, the keyword spotter is in the, the, the greenish teal color there and the face ID is in yellow. What we've compared is our Max N8000 that has a CNN accelerator that runs at 50 megahertz. And we compared that to one of our own very low power Cortex M4F devices that has a, a pretty big memory footprint. It's three megabytes of flash and one megabyte of SRAM. And then we've also compared it to an ST Cortex M7, uh, simply because Maxim doesn't have a, a, a Cortex M7 on the line card. You can see that the keyword spotter on our device executes in two milliseconds with 140 microjoules. And then you see how much uh, longer and higher energy the Cortex-M4F and the Cortex-M7 take. And then the same story on the Face ID where our chip takes 14 milliseconds and about 400 microjoules compared to um, much longer on the Cortex-M4F uh, and the Cortex-M7. You also see with the Cortex-M7 uh, that there's some additional energy required for accessing external DRAM. Uh, because uh, because the Max 32650, the middle uh, product there has a big memory, it doesn't have to go outside for the Face ID application, but the STM7 does. And so you see actually that there's a significant amount of memory burned when you have to go to external memories uh, to, uh, to execute any kind of AI inference. So that's all great. Uh, the, the energy consumption of our part is, is phenomenal. So you know, hopefully you see that you can start to think about vision applications for even battery powered devices. But what's the catch here? Um, there, and there is a catch um, uh, regarding AI technology in the embedded world. And one of the first uh, challenges is that uh, it, traditionally the people who understand machine learning can build models and, and build uh, and train convolutional neural networks uh, come from a very different background and very different education than people who can effectively build uh, embedded devices. Uh, it's a very different skill set and we see very few cases where those skills meet in the same person. Uh, similar to this, the tools used uh, in machine learning to, to, um, uh, to set up and describe a model and then to train it are completely different tools than the tools that an embedded designer is used to. And so th there's a chasm here, there, there's a gap. Uh, and we see that uh, machine learning people are often not the same as the embedded people uh, at our customers. 
So there's definitely a challenge in terms of uh, developing these applications that you need both of these expertises. So that's what we're going to try to approach uh, today is we're and, and in the next session is we're going to go um, through step by step the, the tools available, the documentation available for both the machine learning side and then the embedded development side as well. Um, so in today's session, you know, we'll start off here uh, with a little bit more detailed overview of the Max 78000. We'll go through our GitHub repository and kind of walk you through some of the documentation, and the tools that are there. There's a significant amount of content, so a quick walkthrough is probably called for. Uh, we'll talk about setting up your system for doing machine learning, for, for doing training of, of models for that can eventually target the Max 78000. Uh, we'll talk about the over, uh, an overview of the models that we provide in our GitHub repository, what those look like. Uh, and then we'll actually go through an example of training uh, the keyword spotter. All the data, all the materials are available on GitHub and we'll walk you through it. And we'll close with some further topics on training before we uh, get ready for session number two. And with that, I'll turn it over to Robert who will get into an overview of the Max 78000. Chris gave you the overview from a business perspective of what the Max 78000 is. So we thought we should probably go a little bit more into the technical details of how we achieve what we can achieve with this chip. On this slide, you can see a lot of green bars. That's the inference energy. So when you run a machine learning algorithm, most of its energy at runtime is in the inference, meaning all the matrix multiplications and other operations that are needed to compute the results. On the traditional micro here on the left, there's a lot of green bars and that's to scale. Um, that takes out the majority of all energy. Um, there's a little bit of yellow data manipulation on the IO. Uh, you might have to rearrange your bytes. And of course there is a blue, which is the IO itself, which you probably cannot avoid because how else would you get to your data? How do we go from the traditional micro to the max 78,000, which is on the right. So you can see the green is now practically irrelevant and the yellow, if you're eagle eyed, you'll notice it has shrunk at will. This is a block diagram of the max 78,000. And we drew it in a way that makes it obvious that really half of the die is taken up by the convolutional neural network accelerator. And that's on the right. You can also see there's a lot more to this chip, um, embedded external interfaces, power supplies, some crypto and security, and two microcontroller cores. So there's a Cortex M4 with floating point, as well as a RISC-V core and DMA and onboard flash memory, as well as lots of SRAM. Looking at the CNN accelerator on the right, notice there are 64 parallel processors and lots of memory. So when you total it all up, you'll get to over one megabyte of memory that'll hold the network parameters as well as the data that you're processing. When you remember the big green bars earlier, I said that we optimize some of the data manipulation as well. And that's what this annotated slide shows. So there are additional optimizations in the chip that aren't just the convolutional neural network accelerator, but all kinds of other measures that make the chip lower power. Um, those were mostly inherited from previous low power chips that we had that are used in wearable devices, for example, but also specific things such as FIFOs and optimized data manipulation on the interface between the micro and the CNN accelerator. Now we're getting to the good stuff. On the left side of the slide, you can see a die shot of our Max 78000. And you'll notice at the top, there is a pretty large yellow rectangle. It's about half the die size. That's the region used by the CNN accelerator. You can further see that it's subdivided into four smaller rectangles. Those are the regions and basically they contain the same resources each, they're tiled together. And moving on to the center, the colors correspond. So the yellow shows you four regions, and then we've broken out one red region, which in itself consists of four processors. So four times four times four. So we have 64 processors total, 
four processes each share data memory, but they have their independent math engines as well as the independent parameter memory, and they communicate with one another and bubble the result through, which then gets accumulated at the top level. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, running at 50 megahertz, which is the standard speed that they see in an accelerator runs, whereas the CPU is twice as fast, we get to about 28 billion operations per second. And an operation here means multiply accumulate, so not just an addition or something. The total memory, and I mentioned that briefly earlier, is over 1.5 megabytes of SRAM. Everything's on die there, as well as 512 kilobytes of non-volatile flash memory. So we're trying to keep the distances short and the memory local. The reason for this is that the further you have to move data, the more you have to pay in terms of energy. So obviously, your number one priority is don't read it all if you can. Number two, reduce the distance. And then number three, if you did have to spend the energy to read something, maximize the parallelism. So this slide, we're trying to show, we're really trying to do a data flow system. So you have an input, you do the math on it in the filter, and then you have the output. This is not a percolator. You want to have the data processed and finished when it comes out the bottom. So the main Optimizations in the Mac 78000 are really related to the data path and trying to minimize movement of data. And you will probably realize that nothing is ever free in life. So while this system works extremely well and very fast and very low power for the operators it understands, it is hardware. So you can't just go in and add a piece of software and make it understand a new operator. In this slide, we briefly outline the main operators that are supported by the hardware. There's much more in-depth discussion in the documentation, of course. But I wanted to point out that the main energy efficiency is gained in two-dimensional convolutions with 3x3 three three kernels. That's the most acceleration that you can get. We do support some other things as well, um, for convenience mainly. For example, you can upsample, you can do one-dimensional convolutions, and you can do linear layers. We have mainly values for activation, the element-wise operators, um, pooling. And uh, in some cases, you can combine operators into one layer. For example, if you do a max pool and a convolution, that can shrink into one layer. On the right side of this slide, uh, some other notable things. One is you're not limited to just 8-bit weights, so you can increase the capacity a lot by using 4- or 2-bit weights, for example. Um, data is always 8 bits, and then there's some additional hardware features, like every layer allows you to do a shift before you reduce the output size to 8 bits, and we're using that for quantization-aware training, batch norm, and other things. And one more thing to point out, maybe that's the RISC-V core, which we use as a smart DMA. The RISC-V is just much smaller than the ARM core. It lives in the same clock and power domains as the CNN. And so it can get to the data quickly and we can use it for smart pre-processing of your input data. The last bullet is a streaming mode with FIFOs and I'm going to get to streaming in just a second. Before I get to explaining what streaming mode is, I should talk a little bit about the motivation behind it. This slide is titled, Why is VGA hard? Could also have been titled, Why are images hard? And on the left side there, you see these bubbles. The bubbles scale with the image size. And it's hard because usually you scale both dimensions so it grows up the square. So uh, we can see the little dot down there in the bottom left on the left side. That's a CIFAR 10 famous benchmark, 32 by 32 images. And as it goes up in Tumble videos, that's the limit that that hardware accelerator can do. ImageNet 224 by 224, quarter VGA 320 by 240, and then we have VGA at 640 by 480. So just the sheer area is a lot bigger. Now you might say, well, a VGA image has got three channels red, green, and blue, as shown there in the center. And so that's about 900 kilobytes. What's the big deal? Well, 
that's the input. During a convolution, it's very likely that this will blow up to many times that size. So here we're showing 128 intermediate channels of 640 by 480. And it could be 256 or even more. And that's already 34 megabytes. So this is not going to fit into an embedded memory on die anymore. So now you're going to have to go off die and you're going to pay the price for that. Your distance grows means your energy grows. Your Getting off chip, that means you probably have to use higher voltages, your energy grows. So it's all in all very, very inefficient and very undesirable to do that. And uh, what can you do about this? Well, assuming you didn't want to do the obvious and just not support images or video, um, which would limit the applications quite a bit, you have to come up with another idea. And what we are implementing is streaming mode. Basically, we're taking advantage of the fact that any image sensor will give you data on a row-by-row -row scanning basis. And it turns out that you can start your processing before you have a full image. And this is true for the image sensor itself as well. It does not store a full image at any time. It may have a couple of rows or three or four rows that it buffers, but it will not ever store the full image itself. And so we're feeding the image sensor data in real time through FIFOs into our neural network accelerator. And it's really natural when you're using an image sensor. On the right side, you can see how this might work. So the green data is all the data that you had to have to start processing up to the last layer, okay? Notice the gray, the dark gray in all these layers, that's data that has not been loaded yet. That's not even in the device yet. It hasn't even been scanned in from the image sensor. So once we get to layer N on the right side, we've pre consumed the first input data and we don't need it anymore. And that's marked in red. We can throw it out and reuse that buffer inside our device for new image data. And there's feedback between these layers to make this all work. And you have to match the data rates between your image sensor and the processing speed of the CNN accelerator for this to work. But when it works, it works pretty well, and you can do VDA-sized frames with only 1.5 megabytes of SRAM in the device. Before we get into details, I'd like to quickly walk you through the Maxim integrated AI GitHub repositories. We'll go over some of the information found here in more detail later in the presentation, but for now I just want to make you aware that everything we're about to present is written down and available online at GitHub. The URL is github.com slash maximintegratedai. So we have a few pinned repositories at the top. This is where most of the action happens. The first repo you'll want to take a look at is the documentation repo. You can consider this repo to be the top of the hierarchy and you can use it to navigate to the other repos. Here you will find our evaluation kit and featherboard documentation as well as links to the training and synthesis repos. The evaluation kit and featherboard links take you to a quick start guide specific to each platform. Let's have a quick look at the featherboard documentation. The information you'll find here is aimed at the traditional embedded developer who is interested in quickly compiling and running code on the MCU using the Max 78000 SDK. The SDK has many demonstration C projects which use pre-trained and synthesized models such as MNIST, keyword spotting, and face identification. We'll come back to the SDK later and I'll show you how to compile the demonstration firmware and get it running on the Featherboard using the Eclipse IDE on Windows. For now, let's go back and take a look at the other repositories. This link will take you to the Max 78000 SDK, which is going to be of interest to firmware developers. And the next two links will take you to the training repo and the synthesis repo, which will be of interest to machine learning developers. And let's take a look at the training repo. The training repo contains scripts and other collateral related to creating ML models, managing data sets, and model training. The README contains topics on architecture, tool installation, workflow, and details on tool usage. Quickly jumping over to the synthesis repo, you'll notice the README is very similar 
to what is found in the training repo. Um, the synthesis repo contains scripts that accept the output of the training workflow as an input in order to generate C code that can be run on the MAX 78000. Functions such as quantization and network loading are provided here. Also, you can find the MAX 78000 SDK as a Git submodule, which is referenced by the synthesis tools. We sometimes get asked what PC to buy and what operating system to install. And there's one really important thing that you need to keep in mind, and that's get an NVIDIA card, fairly recent, with lots of memory. That's really the most important thing. Without the NVIDIA card, which supports CUDA, which is NVIDIA's single instruction multiple data library, training will take forever and just won't be a lot of fun. So in theory, you can do it without that card. Um, it'd just be very, very slow. And we do provide pre-trained weights for the networks that we're talking about today. So you can get going even without that card. And secondly, um, you should be using Linux just because most machine learning development is done on Linux and there'll be a lot less friction. We would recommend Ubuntu 20.04. That's a long-term service release and you can install the server or the desktop image depending on whether you want to sit in front of it or whether it's in your closet. And that's really it. With Linux and an NVIDIA card, you're going to be in business, not just for the Mac 78000, but for most every other machine learning system out there. And while I really, really recommend CUDA on a graphics card, we did choose a model today that's much smaller and that can, in a pinch, be trained just on a CPU, assuming you have enough cores. I would expect on a six or eight core CPU, this thing to take about six times, five or six times longer than with a single graphics card. So it should be possible, but again, we're also going to provide the pre-trained weights. So in case it doesn't finish, you'll have them ready to go. There are a few ways you can set up your development workflow depending on what equipment you have available, your development team composition, or just personal preference. It's possible to develop entirely on Linux or Mac OS or even Windows with the help of Windows Subsystem for Linux. However, if you want to travel a well-trodden path, then I'd recommend that you use Linux for your machine learning work and Windows for your embedded work. This is the most well-documented and the only officially supported workflow. So let's head over to the training repo on GitHub and take a look at the instructions for getting your machine learning system up and running. There's a lot of good information in the readme that's worth spending some time with, but for a first look, just scroll down to the project installation section. These instructions are well tested and you should be able to just copy and paste them and be done in, in 20 minutes or so. So I'll leave that uh, for you to explore offline. Ultimately, you want to be able to successfully execute one of the training scripts. So let's have a look at that. I've opened a bash terminal to the training repo that I previously cloned. Uh, and before you do anything, you'll want to run source, bin activate. And when you do that, you'll notice that uh, it changes your prompt to indicate that you're in training mode. And what this does is just sets up your Python environment specific to the needs of training. Uh, so now we're ready to do some training. Uh, and for the purpose of verifying the install, the first training script I like to run is uh, MNIST. So you can type in train underscore mnist.sh and kick that off. This will take quite a while on a non-CUDA platform like mine, so I'll just time warp us ahead to the finish line. And finally we're done. Uh, so once you get to the end of training, you should see something like this. Uh, the last line uh, indicates a log file and it gives you the full path uh, to a subdirectory under training uh, called logs which is organized by date. So each time you train a model, uh, it'll get organized into the logs folder. So now we've, we've verified that uh, our install is complete and correct, uh, at least as far as training goes. Now more than likely, if 
if you can train, then you're going to be able to synthesize as well. But uh, it's quick to go ahead and verify uh, the synthesizing functionality. So let's do that now. So remember that we are uh, running in a training environment right now. And what we want to do is switch over to the synthesis environment. To do that, first you'll want to run the deactivate command and then change directory to your synthesis directory. And here we can source bin activate to activate the synthesis environment. Now we can run gen demos max 78000.sh. This will synthesize all demos using pre trained data and output to SDK examples max 78000 CNN. And we're done. So let's check the output directory, make sure that looks good. SDK examples max 78000 CNN. And we see all of our all of our demos there. So at this point, um, install is good. We've got output. Now all of these demos can can be imported into Eclipse and burned into the flash on the Max 78000 and run. Let's take a closer look at the contents of the training repository. You will see several Bash scripts associated with each of the demonstration models. These scripts are for convenience and allow you to quickly train and evaluate models for several demos supported by the EV kit and the Featherboard. They can also serve as a guide for producing customized training for your own applications. Let's cat one of the training scripts and you'll, you'll see that they all uh, look pretty similar. Uh, they, they basically call train PY to train the indicated model in this case AI85 Net5 against a specific data set, in this case MNIST. Let's cat KW20SH for comparison. You can see that it has a lot of the same options, but as you would expect, the data set and model are different. So each of the training scripts deals with a specific demo supported by the EV kit and Feather. Let me give you a brief introduction to each demo. Cats and Dogs is an image classification demonstration that tries to differentiate between images of cats and images of dogs. It uses a 25,000 image data set from Kaggle.com. Um, by, by the way, all the information I'm discussing now can be found in the readmes inside each examples source code directory. And I'll show you exactly where to find these in another session. Next we have the CIFAR demonstration which comes in two main flavors, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. CIFAR is a labeled image classification data set consisting of 10 and 100 image classes respectively. Each class has 6,000 images of things like uh, vehicles and animals. CIFAR 10 consists of low resolution images which can be useful during early stage model development since smaller data sets generally require less training time and so reduces iteration time as you make the first few course adjustments to your model. Face ID is another image classifier that attempts to differentiate between a few faces as well as identify unknown faces. It is trained with the VGG Face 2 data set with the MTCNN and FaceNet models. Next is KWS20, a popular speech-centric application for the Max 78000. It's a 20-word keyword spotter which can identify keywords such as left, right, 0 through 9, and several others. It uses second version of Google's speech commands data set along with AI85 KWS20 net model. This is a good example to start with if you're interested in keyword classification applications. We have an app note on the Maxim Integrated website that provides a deep dive into how the model works and its implementation on the 78000. This is a very good resource for general information on speech processing models and methods, uh, as well as uh, specifics of the Max 78000 CNN. You can find it by going to MaximumIntegrated.com and searching for AN7359. Finally, we have MNIST, which is sort of the hello world of machine learning. 
It's an image classifier with the purpose of classifying handwritten digits. It's relatively quick to train and it's a great candidate for those who are new to machine learning. The MNIST data set consists of 60,000 handwritten digits alongside a test set of 10,000 additional images. Each digit image is 28 by 28 pixels in size. All of the demos in this directory use publicly available data sets which are downloaded as needed as part of the training process. These data sets are stored locally in the data directory. While we are here I'd like to point out other aspects of the training repository. Alongside the training scripts you will find correlating evaluation scripts. These can optionally be used to evaluate post-synthesis training model performance. Browsing the tree further, you'll notice several subdirectories. Let me bring your attention to a few of the more important ones. Data, as mentioned before, is where datasets get downloaded, uncompressed, and adjusted as necessary. The datasets directory contains scripts that facilitate interfacing with publicly available datasets. Uh, the logs directory is where the output of each training session will be stored. And finally, the models directory uh, is where you'll find Python classes that implement each of the models used by the demonstrations. Um, these Python classes are a good guide to creating your own custom models. Before we start training our model, I wanted to give you an overview of the development process. And as you can see on the slide, I've divided it into two sections. Uh, the top is what we're going to do today, and the bottom is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And the top, you can see the main box is training. This is where we take our model and our training and test data set and create the weights using backpropagation. That takes a while, so we split it between the days during training, so basically you can let it run overnight. And tomorrow we're going to go take our trained weights, which are in floating point, and we'll convert them to integer using a quantization, which creates another checkpoint file. And that checkpoint file then can be run through evaluation to see how good it is. And when we're happy, we're going to take that checkpoint file, run it through the ISER tool, create embedded C code um, using some additional files that we'll talk about tomorrow. So that's the overview. And I think we might be ready to start training now. At this point, we're ready to start training our example project. And the example project is keyword spotting, 20 keywords, and the third model that we have, so KWS 20 V3. I'm sitting on my Linux command prompt with a huge font that I chose so you can actually see what's going on. Inside the training repo subdirectory, and I have my virtual environment active. You can see that up here. I'm current, get status. So nothing left to do there. Everything is ready to go. We have example scripts for all of the model and data set combinations inside the scripts directory. So let's go look in there. And unsurprisingly, the training script for KWS 20 v3 is called train underscore KWS 20 underscore v3 dot sh. I'm going to go start that script right now so you can see what's going on and what it should look like when everything is working correctly. So scripts slash train underscore kws20 underscore v3.sh. I'm also going to add one more command line option that you don't have to. I'm going to restrict it to a single GPU, which is probably what most of you have. So dash dash. GPU zero. All right, and off it goes. So you can see it is creating a log file and then it does some data prep. That data prep went by real fast. And the first time you run this, it'll probably take a lot longer. Um, it'll cache that and so you don't have to do it again. Now we are ready training and you can see there's 256 samples per mini batch and it takes about 0.03 seconds. So we can go into another window and type NVIDIA-SMI, and that shows us the resources that are currently used. And you can see it's only 1.3 gigabytes on the graphics card out of the 24 gigabytes it has. 
and using 35% of the GPU resources. That's very little. We chose that so that the script can be used by most anybody regardless of GPU choice. So we're ready in the second round here, and I'm going to pause this when it comes and finishes that epic. So you can see what the verification run looks like. So here it's doing a verification and then it's printing a confusion matrix that shows you how good it already is. And you can already see the diagonal going there. Now at the same time that this is training and we're just looking at the graphical output, at the command line output here, we also have TensorBoard support. So you could get a graphical representation and follow the training progress using your web browser. And just refer to the documentation if you wanna do that. I'm going to abort this now and show you the difference when we are just using the CPU. Again, this model is chosen specifically to make it not too painful if you don't have a GPU. So I'm saying scripts slash train underscore KWS20 underscore V3.sh dash dash CPU, which will suppress the installed GPUs. Just to see, show you the difference here. And again, in this particular model, it's not going to be so bad. It's much worse with images than with audio. So you can see it's 0 0.24, 0 0 0.2, 0 0.18. So we'll say maybe factor four or five, which is the lowest I've seen. Again, the reason why we chose this model so that anybody can follow along. Okay, uh, <laughs> this is terrible. So I'm gonna stop this and I will start my original again, PU zero. And then now you could go away, have a coffee and more coffee. And it's set to auto terminate and everything. But we're also providing the pre-trained weights for you already. So you don't really have to go through this if you don't want to. And that's how you start training a model. So while a training script is continuing in the background, let's go switch to a web browser and take a look at the code to see what's actually going on behind the scenes there while we are training this. If you've used PyTorch before or any other deep learning framework, you're probably going to be very familiar with this setup. There is one main training loop. In our case, it's called train.py. And that one's really driving the forward back propagation in a big loop. So train.py, really that's, that's really it. It has two main functions and all kinds of little extra stuff like saving checkpoints and such. But it also instantiates the model and the data set. It's all dynamic. So you can just write a new model or provide a new data set and put those in the respective directories. So for the KWS 20 V3, we're using the KWS 20 data set, which is in here in the data sets directory. And we're using the KWS 20 V3 model, which is in the models directory. Let's go open that model because that is where it begins to be a little more interesting. So in this model, um, you have an instantiation of the NN modules at the top, and then just the standard forward prop like in any other PyTorch system. And PyTorch does the back prop automatically. You just need to specify forward prop. You'll notice the orange calls up top here. And it says fuse, con something, and it always has an AI 8x in front of it. These are custom submodules. So they are inheriting from the NN modules, but we're also augmenting them with some knowledge about our hardware, primarily clipping and rounding but some other ones um, sound very normal, like linear. That's very similar to nn.linear, whereas the fused ones will do both, in this case, a conf1d plus a ReLU in one layer, or in this case, fused max pool conf1d ReLU, it will do max pool conf1d and the ReLU in one layer. So that's a feature of our hardware that we can do pooling and convolution 
in the same layer. So this saves hardware resources and make things faster. And so we are providing these fused modules. Of course, you could also separate them out if you wanted to do that, but why not? And then here there's a standard NN dot dropout because that's really not used during inference anymore. That just happens during training. And uh, you look in the models directory, there are many more that are partially more complicated than this KWS 20 V3. But um, if the hardware supports what you want to do, you're not going to have any trouble porting your model to the max 78,000. While we're training our KWS model, I wanted to give you a few pointers on what you have to do to train your own data set and model. And the data set also includes the data loader where you would do data augmentation. For example, when you're training images, you can change the background or rotate the image or do any number of these things. In terms of audio, we would add different types of noise. When you look at the KWS 20 loader, you will see that there's just Gaussian noise right now, so that could be improved. Now, I have already pointed you to the data set and model subdirectories, but then the next step would be to take a look at the big readme file. And here, there are two versions of this. There's a markdown and a PDF. The markdown is mainly so you can see it on GitHub when you scroll down, but it's missing, for example, the table of contents, and it does not show any equations. So I would say open up the readme file. So here we are in the readme.pdf, and it's a pretty big file, but in our defense, we're not just talking about the training process, but also the hardware resources, as well as how to convert code into C, which is the topic for tomorrow's session. Um, right after this, we're also going to be available for live Q&A. So I'm hoping to talk to you now and then see you again tomorrow. Thank you.